The federal government budgets for fuel subsidy in the first half of 2022. Pledges to end subsidy payment right after that. The Muslim rights concern pushes for a Yoruba Muslim president come 2023. We'll be reviewing today's uh, newspapers and off the press uh, this morning. Good morning and thanks for joining us on uh, The Breakfast here on Plus TV Africa. Middle of the week, it's a Wednesday morning already and uh, we're just about wrapping up the uh, month of October. I am Osaogi Ogbon. And I am Messi Boko. It's good to have you join us. All right, uh, of course, we always will start with the top trending stories, um, major conversations that have, you know, you know, gone across the country in the last 24 hours. And we're starting with uh, Pastor Tunde Bakari, who's made the news again not long ago. Uh, he was in the news for criticizing President Muhammad Buhari and said, uh, you know, a couple of things, you know, about how he has lost his, you know, his, his support, you know, and how he, you know, the president stopped listening to him after winning the election and a couple of other things. Um, but he was, of course, quoted as saying yesterday that, um, you know, to win the elections in 2023, you would have to somehow, some way, negotiate with the North. Um, of, of course, it's not the first time, you know, um, this narrative has been pushed out. Uh, but, of course, uh, this is coming from Pastor Tunde Bakari once again, you know, who uh, somehow, some way, has a loud voice politically um, across Nigeria. Sometimes he decides that he's, you know, going to be stepping back and not getting himself involved. But, of course, every now and then you still get to see him um, making certain statements on Sunday, um, you know, just to push his point and, uh, you know, get himself, you know, somehow, some way involved. Well, I'd say that some element of truth in what he said, uh, that's because if you look at it at a time where Nigeria, you know, were regional, we had the regional government, uh, you find out that, however, from the beginning, uh, the British have always... Uh, you know, they just made it that uh, the North would constantly dominate. And so it's important because of size, uh, because of, you know, geographical location. I mean, we're talking about population and in terms of, you know, land uh, space that they occupy. So you see that. However, not necessarily negotiation. I'm thinking it's, you know, finding a way to woo them. And uh, because that's what it's about, your ability to convince, okay, this is who I am, sell yourself properly, uh, that you're a candidate of X, Y, Z, and that this is what you have on the table, uh, that's it. So, but to some extent, I think what he said uh, has some element of truth. He's not wrong. Because uh, like I mentioned earlier on, it, it feels like that that's, has always been, you know, what it is. They were created. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people would not find this statement very funny, but to be very realistic, that's the uh, that's what it has been. I agree with the idea of of um, you know convincing. I I agree with the idea of being able to sell yourself as a candidate to every part of the country. You need to move you know in different directions and sell yourself. But unfortunately, Nigeria's political space is um, is is plugged in with you know different factors that make um, even that selling yourself impossible. You know, not not necessarily impossible, but there are certain hurdles because there's the religious aspect of it, there's the tribal aspect of it, there's the regional aspect of it, there's also the political party aspect of it, you know, and it, it, this is no longer just selling yourself to different regions and different parts of the country. This is now having to say that, well, you know, I am Christian or I am Muslim, or having to say that, oh, I, you know, I belong to this political party or that political party, or I am from this tribe or that tribe. One of the conversations we're going to be having this morning is about a Yoruba Muslim president that Mirik is pushing for. Um, normally, you shouldn't be hearing those type of conversations. Of you course. You should be thinking about, you know, the quality of the person and, um, you know, the competence of the person to hold that seat. But we have plugged in the idea of religion um, and tribe in, in, in this conversation concerning especially, yourself. Yeah, especially um, at a time where, you know, the unity of this country is threatened. I mean, if you look uh, to the southern part of the country, you find the agitation. Uh, you come also to the, you know, southwest. You also find that some group of persons, the Oduduwa Republic, are also saying, oh, we want to go away. Uh, should we be having this kind of conversation at this point in time that has been on my mind but however it is what it so, is so this is where there's a challenge you know I, I decided to start with saying that yes you know there's the need to sell yourself which is expected you know in every political space in the world but this is where there's a challenge with uh, Pastor Tunde Bakari's statement 
Um, I, I listened to a, um, a conversation um, um, on Twitter Spaces some time ago, and you know, the person basically said that the northern electorate and the people from the north are like the orcs in Lord of the Rings. Um, they basically are used when it's time to win elections, when it's time to cook up figures, when it's time to you know, paint this imaginary picture that there is a gazillion people, a gazillion voters in that part of the, of the country. Um, so they, they use them like the orcs, you know, and when they are done with that election, you know, they abandon until it's time to win an election again. Um, we've not got, been able to, you know, have a proper conversation about Nigeria's census and Nigeria's voting figures to be, if we're being honest with ourselves. The numbers of people that are used or that, you know, you see from certain states in the north, um, sadly, you know, a lot of times people would always say that these things aren't real. You know, I don't, there's no, people would argue that there is no, you know, there's no clarity as to whether these figures are true or not. But you can um, also not, okay, let me, let me, let me, let me allow me you to. Mm -hmm. um, sadly also, the northerners um, and the, the poor level of education and the plug-in of religion and tribe and, you know, and all of that into their space has made them no longer able to make a decision for themselves. The, the negotiation that Tunde Bakari is speaking with now, speaking of now, is not with the Northern electorate. It's not with the, the Abu and the, the Ismail and, and Fatima and the rest of them. It is with the Northern leadership, you know, somehow the traditional and political leadership in the North, not with the people. So you're not, he's not necessarily saying you need to sell yourself to these people who are going to vote for you, these two million voters in Kano, these one million voters in, in Katsina and the likes. He's really speaking about the Northern uh, political leadership, not the people. And the reason is the people aren't or have not been able to, you know, be educated enough to make those decisions for themselves. They've also been divided and been polarized by religion and tribe that they cannot make a very clear decision on competence anymore. Their decisions are based on who their um, MI tells them to vote. It's based on who their northern political leadership tells them to vote, not because they themselves have been able to be, be smart enough to make a decision on leadership by themselves. And that's really where the, the huge or the biggest challenge for me is. Um, until we have a proper census, until we're able to verify those voting figures from the north, they will continue to push this narrative. And also remember that these northern discussions we're having, they create a narrative that the middle belt, a lot of the middle belt states are plugged into the whole northern picture, um, which shouldn't be. No, but uh, I still think that, you know, because I also remember having this conversation, I mean, off uh, air like this with someone and... Uh, yes, it's okay to say because we've had cases where figures were having figures being manipulated. We're having facts that during the elections you have underage uh, children voting and all of that. But you still can't take out. I mean, Kano, which of which local government, which state in Nigeria has the highest local government? You want to say Kano? I mean, look at that, 44. So I still, yes, as much as we say we need to have, you know. Um, that census we need to verify our uh, population and the figures get that clarity and you know be able to say this is what it is but we can't still take out the fact that numerically they do have that strength it's not a fact <laughs> let's leave you, it at that if you've said if you said we need to have a proper census then you cannot call it a fact that they have those you know those figures they do you know but, but, okay so, so not. okay you know for and, instance. and until we have a proper census if you look at nigeria's <laughs> census um, um, history, um, you would see, you know, from the 60s that there has been some challenge with, you know, the reason behind, you know, not being able to have actual clarity with our census figures. And the reason there's that many local government areas in, in those parts is for particular reasons, not because those local governments have been, you know, necessarily, you know, were necessary to be created to cater for the people. It's therefore a political reason. Um, and until we have a proper census, it's not a fact that they have those figures. Anyways, I'm sure that we we'll definitely, uh, you know, get to that point where we're able to verify all of that. Okay, so moving away from that, uh, let's also talk about another interesting issue that was also put up, uh, you know, on different spaces and generating a lot of conversation. Of course, the Minister of Information, Lai Mohammed, says the reason the Nigerian government is regulating, you know, the social media space is so we can avoid World War uh, three, the Third World War, of course. And uh, that's the reason. Well, I'm asking myself, the reason why we had the First World War, uh, 
you know, first and second world, the second world war, okay, let's start with the second world war. Was, you, you want to look at it, you talk about the great economic depression and the fact that some treaty, the peace treaty that was signed, you know, to end the world war, the first world war, did not actually solve the problem at the time. Several issues, you also have issues of invasion of military at the time. So uh, all of this uh, noted. Now, if we say that we are actually emulating China, China operates, uh, you know, closed economy, a socialist economy, and they do have a reason because they want to grow, they want to ensure that they have local industries, um, they want to promote, um, uh, you know, independent local products, local technology, and, and that would be it. So um, when we say we're emulating, I'm sure that we need to understand. So I don't know, um, I don't understand I, I totally understand that, yeah, yeah, sometimes you could say there are some things that could be put out on the social media that could actually cause or generate issues. But let's look at some of the issues. I'm not saying that fake news does not fly on that space. Yes, we do have. But let's really, really look at, you know, um, some of the stories that have been put out, some of the things, because people go on Twitter, people go on Facebook, people go on other platforms, you know, to express their um, anger. It's like you don't have anyone to talk to, and you go to that platform, and then you put it, and then maybe you have someone who jumps on your thought and then they begin to express themselves. So I don't know where the third world war is going to come from because if you look at the things that caused the second world war, uh, I, I, I don't think that um, oh. you know there's any correlation or connection with that. Oh, or maybe um, he's just actually putting out that point, you know, to pass a message. Yeah, I think you know what he's trying to say is you know the he he basically was trying to you know express from his perspective the danger of fake news on social media. Um, and saying, you know, that it is now so bad that he fears uh, that the next world war will be caused by fake news. Um, um, and that's the reason a lot of countries are starting to put regulations on their social media platforms. And he does think that Nigeria should be different. And then spoke about the Twitter ban and said that Donald Trump also did, you know, support uh, the, the Twitter ban here in Nigeria um, and some of all of that. Um, he does have a point, you know, about the danger of fake news, you know, but at the same time, you know, it's interesting, it's important to know that um, most countries across the world have their own social media regulations and their own regulations with regards um, fake news. Um, and it's not necessarily to ban a social media platform. You know, there's many laws that have already been put in place to checkmate people selling or putting out fake news. These same persons that are complaining about fake news today or complaining about, um, um, you know, social media today use the same social media when they needed it to get, you know, in, in, into government. Um, like Mohammed's concern really is not about fake news in particular, it's about, social, it's, it's about government critics and being able to, and, and that's what you've seen over time, that it's mostly about people being able to speak their minds against the current administration and that's what they've tried to silence, not necessarily about fake news. Um, the fake news has been in existence for a long time. No country has been torn apart because of fake news. Um, there's, you know, um, laws put in place, there's counter arguments, um, and there's, you know, much of that. I remember in the beautiful the elections, they used the same Twitter. Um, the government of Kaduna State, you know, you know, made mention, I'm sure it is still on his Twitter page, uh, that, um, you know, he was on a sniper's list by former President Goodluck Jonathan. He was, uh, he was number 12 or number 20 on the list. And, you know, it, it was just a lot of nonsense. Um, um, I remember, you know, that, that there was so much, so, so much that was said in 2014 leading to the elections. Um, but right after that, you know, those same, you know, platforms now need to be suspended because, well, you know, it's no longer going in their favor. And that's what it looks like. So it's more about control, control. and, you oh. know, being able to, you know, you know control the, the, the narrative and sell only what the government wants to sell uh, and not necessarily because fake news is such a huge problem that will lead to the Third World War. Um, but yeah, this is the Minister of Information. Well, uh, we hope that we don't get to, you know, get to that point where there would be a third world war. Another uh, issue also is the fact that, uh, yes, an American lady has expressed her concern, her experience actually, when she visited Nigeria with her husband and uh, she talked about extortion, making her feel very bad, crying about, um, uh, you know, her COVID-19 test and making her, you know, question a lot of things. Uh, I'm sure that we probably would have maybe some pictures or videos if we do have. Uh, we're going to show you all of that, you know. She, there was also an audio to that particular effect. I mean, she talked a lot about it. Uh, she was expressing herself what happened when she came to Nigeria. It's really bad. But I think that the issue of extortion is not just um, limited to 
um, you know, the transport system or to this particular one, something that's ongoing, almost everywhere. So you go to a particular office, you get to a particular space, including the men of the Nigerian police, you've seen security agencies. I mean, this is not fake news. This is for real, something that I have, you know, experienced firsthand, uh, all of this extortion. And I don't know how we're going to end it because uh, it's something that has eaten very deep into our system. And I'm hoping that at some, day, at some point we find a way to end this menace. Mm. I, I think she was really complaining about her experience uh, visiting Nigeria for the first time. And how, you know, I, I watched a video or some parts of the video she put out. You know, how, um, um, you know, when people see you coming in from, from a different country, when Nigerian um, officials rather at the airport see you coming from a different country, they immediately see you as a cash cow and look out for ways that they can make money off you. And so they lie and tell you, you know, that you need to get this document or you need to, you know, be, be quarantined for seven days or, you know, random things like that, you know, and then tell you that to get out of it, you have to pay. Um, and that's what she was expressing, you know, she was basically advising other people who are going to be visiting Nigeria uh, to ensure that they have all their documents in check because the people at the airports will try to, you know, fleece you and get some money off you. Um, and it really is just expressing what everybody knows, um, and not just Americans or people coming in from you know other countries, even here in Nigeria. As long as you know Nigerian public office are you know eighty percent of the time, um, and I think she also mentioned that it's not everybody at the airport, but you know it does happen. Um, but it, th these are experiences that we always we, we know about, you know, and uh, the the. Um, the, the corruption that we continue to speak about is not just in, you know, in, in government offices or in, you know, in state government houses or in the House of, of Assembly or National Assembly. It's among uh, the Nigerian public service space, um, at the airports, at, you know, the, you know, the ministries and departments and agencies, in customs, in immigration, um, everywhere that you can imagine. In the hospitals, this is the same country where people were selling, you know, fake uh, COVID-19 um, um, uh, tests. Um, and so it, it's not it's not news to anybody that these things happen. You know, she was really just sharing her own personal experience, um, and I've repeatedly said that we cannot fight corruption by simply um, arresting big men every now and then. We can't fight corruption by simply looking out for past governors or senators and you know that have corruption cases to answer. There has to be more of the influx of technology and a t completely um, um, a mechanized space in you know, systems basically, you know, that are put across MDAs across the country that make it difficult for you to steal or to take, you know, money off government. Um, and that's, you know, one of the things that needs to be done in order to actually fight corruption. I remember the passport office when they, when David Hundain put out the, um, the report on the, on the corruption in, the, in Andreas' passport um, office. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, well, there was um, the chairman of the, um, I'm not sure who he was now, um, but the guy at the top of the passport office then went undercover you know, to go to apply for passport and see how you can also catch the people that are, you know, rubbing nine. <laughs> uh, so he went undercover, you know, and tried to, yeah, I think the same thing that a few governors have done every now and then, you know, driving an unmarked vehicle to try and catch the people that are selling oh, petrol really? for, you know, higher <laughs> rates than the other. It's, it's just, it's just theatrics. Um, they know, you know, and we know that we lack systems that should be in place in order to end and fight corruption better. And when we talk about fighting corruption, it's not just, and, and I think one of our guests has said it here before, that when you're accusing a governor of stealing 7 billion naira or 10 billion naira or 2 billion naira, we fail to remember that it's not just the governor. The governor didn't walk into the state coffers or into the bank and pack all that money in his suit and run away. There's many people in that space that facilitated so the stealing mm -hmm. of those funds. And so it's, it just shows lack of systems and, of course, the Nigerian behavior. And usually, like I always say, uh, that the society that we have is a reflection. I mean, the leaders that we have is a reflection of our society. And so a corrupt society will always throw up corrupt leaders. So yes, we're over, always very quick to say the governor is corrupt, the president is corrupt, and those in his cabinet and all of that. But if you look at your space, let's look at the space that you control. Let's look at the fact that you're a bank manager. Let's look at the fact that you are an MD of an organization. What are you doing with the funds? Are you you know, taking and um, basiling, are you diverting funds and all of that. So these are some of the questions, including, you know, very little things as breaking, you know, not respecting the traffic laws and all of that. Yeah. These are some of the issues. I'm thinking that we're not even ready to have this conversation about corruption and corrupt practices. Yeah, we need to go. It's, it, 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 it's, we've spoken about this here. I'm not sure if you were here then. When we, we, they were talking about um, how in some certain places in Lagos, there is meant to be a sign that says, 
you know, it's a one a one way street or don't pass this road. But police officers or LASMA or, you know, the yellow fevers as we call them, wouldn't, you know, place those signs or the government wouldn't put those signs in place. They wouldn't also tell you. They will wait for you to drive into the street first and <laughs> then somebody will block your car in front there and then ask you for 10000 or 50000 or whatever it is. It's the same. It's a corruption in, in, in every single corner across the country. And that includes in the airport and in the hospitals and in, you know, in our customs and immigration, everywhere that you can imagine. There is those things, you know, simply because of the lack of systems and, um, and technology to checkmate these things. And do you uh, think, okay, I, I'm thinking that we're going to have this conversation some other time because okay. at the end of the day, these technologies, these systems... Uh, would not be operated by spirit. They're operated by human beings. And so I'm thinking, would technology sure. eradicate corruption? I'm sure it will. Stay with us. Um, Ademola Akimbala joins us next for Off the Press, where we get to share stories, making headlines across Nigeria today, and um, have his uh, perspective on these stories. We'll be back. <laughs>